The reading this morning comes from Leviticus chapter 18, verses 1 to 30. I'll leave you a few moments to get those pages up. Leviticus chapter 18, 1 to 30. The Lord said to Moses, I speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live. You must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. Do not follow their practices. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and laws, for the person who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. No one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations. I am the Lord. Do not dishonor your father by having sexual relations with your mother. She is your mother. Do not have relations with her. Do not have sexual relations with your father's wife. That would dishonor your father. Do not have sexual relations with your sister, either your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she was born in the same home or elsewhere. Do not have sexual relations with your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter. That would dishonor you. Do not have sexual relations with the daughter of your father's wife, born to your father. She is your sister. Do not have sexual relations with your father's sister. She is your father's close relative. Do not have sexual relations with your mother's sister because she is your mother's close relative. Do not dishonor your father's brother by approaching his wife to have sexual relations. She is your aunt. Do not have sexual relations with your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. Do not have relations with her. Do not have sexual relations with your brother's wife. That would dishonor your brother. Do not have sexual relations with both a woman and her daughter. Do not have sexual relations with either her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter. They are her close relatives. That is wickedness. Do not take your wife's sister as a rival wife and have sexual relations with her while your wife is living. Do not approach a woman to have sexual relations during the uncleanness of her monthly period. Do not have sexual relations with your neighbor's wife and defile yourself with her. Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Molech, for you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Do not have sexual relations with an animal and defile yourself with it. A woman must not be, present herself to an animal to have sexual relations with it. That is a perversion. Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways because this is how the nations that I am going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you must keep my decrees and my laws. The native born and the foreigners residing among you must not do any of these detestable things. For all these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you. Everyone who does any of these detestable things, such persons must be cut off from their people. Keep my requirements and do not follow any of the detestable customs that were practiced before you came and do not defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Maria. And let's pray together.
Lord, we come, um, we come in humility before your word. We come expectant to you, the speaking God who directs his church, who strengthens his people. We come, Lord, in a, a time of um, confusion and a time when um, your church in the West has compromised in many ways. A hard um, time, a hard time to hold fast to your truth. Nevertheless, through the power of your Spirit, um, you bring strength to your church and through the word that you have spoken, applied to our hearts. And so we ask now that you'll make our hearts ready, remove any clutter, drive out falsehood, and plant your truth and direct us in the ways of holiness, we pray. Amen. Um, we live in a sex-saturated society. Um, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> uh, don't really need to be stated. Um, growing up as a family, we would gather around to watch the Waltons and Little House um, on the prairie. Wholesome family um, viewing. The whole family, young and old. Uh, but now the corny blind date has given way to the raunchy Love Island. And period dramas like Downton Abbey have become the debauched Bridgerton. Sex is ever-present, a theme on television, the internet, in films, music, and books. I might say, even at my tender age of 47, oh, let's turn the clocks back 34 years. It was so much better then. And true enough, it probably um, was. However, turn black back the clocks 3,400 years and things were very much the same as today. Canaanite culture was a sex-saturated culture. Now, here in the UK, we have so distorted and twisted God's design for sex and marriage that it's hardly recognizable um, in the society at large. The word used in Leviticus um, to summarize um, sexual activity outside of God's design and decree is perversion. Um, it's there in verse 23. Uh, perversion, it carries the idea in the word, is things that are confused or mixed that ought not to be confused um, and mixed. Now, who could deny that in our culture, um, here in the West, there is so much confusion. Confusion reigns, doesn't it? in the West over these matters. We've legitimized and legalized that which God hates, and we've promoted the mixing of things that God has commanded us to keep separate. So Leviticus 18 is certainly um, a chapter and a word for our time, isn't it? So I want to equip us with three um, challenges from Le Leviticus 18. Number one, we need to sit under God's word when so many seem to stand in opposition to it. Number two, we need to stand apart from the world when they're inviting us at all points to sit with them. And we need to step forth in humility when we're tempted to just walk away. Those are the three challenges that Leviticus 18 will present to us. So here's the first, sit under God's um, word. I hope you saw when Maria was reading um, that the big theme in those opening verses and throughout um, the chapter is that the Lord is God. I am the Lord, um, your God. He alone has the authority and the right to direct human affairs and human laws. Six times uh, in this chapter alone, God reminded the people that he is God. And in a confused world, where people are seeking to determine what their, own, what their own preferred pronouns are, do you know what God's preferred pronoun is? I am he. Why does that matter? It matters because he alone is the self-existent one. He alone is the uncreated creator. He alone has the right and authority to determine 
he and she and matters of sex and sexuality because he alone has made all things. And so the world has been told and sold an evil lie in the area of marriage, sex, gender, and sexuality. A lie that says, oh, it's all about self-expression and it's about self-realization. You've heard it, haven't you? That's the language that they use. And Leviticus 18 says, no, it's not about self-expression. It's not about self-realization. It's about self-rule. It's a matter of who has authority in this world and who has authority over your life. And the wicked lie is to convince you that you are the final authority and that your feelings govern your life and govern the world. That is what's been proposed here in the UK. And Leviticus 18 says, no, your feelings don't rule you, nor do they rule society, nor do they rule the world. They never have and they never will. You see, the only, uh, the, one, uh, the only one who can say, I am he, he's the one who decides who is he and who is she. And he declares that the place for sex is between one he and one she, as he has defined it, within marriage. And nobody else has the right to say otherwise. But on this matter of authority, we'll have to settle here for a while because it's a big issue. Who has the authority to determine what is right and wrong, what is pure or perverted when it comes to sexual activity? Well, what are the options? Well, here's the first option, what I call the law of the lad or lady. What that basically means is every individual decides for herself or himself what is right and wrong according to their own mind, their own feelings. Um, in the evening at the network service, we're looking at the book of Judges, where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Well, how did that work out? With the deterioration of life in Israel. You see, what is right in your eyes may not be right in another person's eyes, and it certainly may not be right in God's eyes. And that causes a big problem because if what you determine to be right in your own eyes is not right in another person's eyes, even that will start to break the fabric of society. And then to add whether it's right in God's eyes or not. So that's why so many favor the law of the land. This is what's happened here in the UK. Well, okay, then let's go with the majority and let's go with the, um, the law. Let's go with the, the standards and submit to the standards if society sees it at large. Surely that's better than consulting personal opinion. But here's a question I have. Whenever people talk about morality by the majority, which majority is included? Even in this country, say, well, do we mean the world or the West? Because we've got a real problem here. Because the West that's trying to make all its amends and apologize for everything it's done in various countries around the world. But if you ask the rest of the world or find in the majority, um, do the rest of the world and the majority of the world believe what the West believes about sexuality and gender? No. So what majority are we going for? Well, of course, what we really mean in the UK is our majority, the majority of the West, because we're what? But they won't say it. We're superior um, to everyone else. You see, it really doesn't matter what we mean when we say which majority. So you see, what we need is an authority that transcends cultural differences and personal decisions. We need an authority that actually will seek the good of people Protect the weak and the innocent. We need God's transcendent authority. We need the law of the Lord. You see, for the people of God, for you and I, if we're followers of Christ, the issue of authority is settled. The law of the Lord is our authority. 
You see, sexual ethics have always been the marker and an indicator of whether God's people want to remain faithful to him or go the way of the world. What's happened in 3,400 years? God said to the Israelites, this will be a marker for you of whether you want to be faithful to me or faithful to the society in which you live. Now, in 2024, the same markers and the same indicators are there. Thus, as it's always been the case throughout the history of God's people. For as followers of Jesus, we cannot waver on our source of authority. The law of the lad or the lady, personal opinion, is not superior to the law of the Lord. The law of the land, public opinion, must be rejected by us if it goes against the law of the Lord. Our authority is God's word. He rules and him alone. And before we move on to think about standing apart and stepping forth, let me say something about why God gets to make the rules. Because one thing to say, okay, we'll reject the law of the lad and lady, we'll reject the law of the land, okay, we're settling on the law of the Lord. Why does God get to make the rules? Well, firstly, because he created us and he created sex. If I was to summarize the early chapters of Genesis and their teaching on this, it's quite straightforward, isn't it? God identifies a need. Adam is alone. God proposes a solution. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Then God demonstrates that his solution is going to be the only solution because he parades all the animals before Adam and no suitable helper is found in those, obviously. So God executes his plan and he creates a woman from a man. And then God himself, I suppose, performs the first marriage as he walks Eve down the aisle and presents Eve to Adam. And then there's wonderful celebration as Adam sings this joyful so song. She is a suitable helper for him. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken from man. And then God gives them a command to be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth and subdue it, which they can do because one man and one woman together can create children, which one man and one man can't, and one woman and one woman can't, and none of the beasts of the field that were paraded before Adam could. So God created us and he created sex. The one flesh union of Genesis is a relationship by God's design. So why should God be the authority over sex and marriage? Because he's the one who created them. But secondly, he earns us, and he created us in his image. Um, our identity, our identity as human beings, comes from being image bearers, that we bear the image of God. Now, our society argues this. I've summarized loads, lots of the arguments in this um, para paragraph. Remove from someone their right to choose their sexuality, their sexual expression, their ability to identify as and put in whatever you like, and you remove that person's personhood. Okay? That's the argument. But that's not true. That is a destructive lie from the pit of hell itself. People are made in the image of God, not in the image of their sexual preference or sexual practice. You do not lose your identity submitting to the law of the Lord. You find it. That's where your identity is found. Thirdly, he loves us and gives us what is good. This is crucial uh, when we approach any conflict between our feelings and God's words. You see, we've been shaped and molded uh, in our culture um, to believe that we are only truly living if we can fulfill our feelings. Therefore, if our feelings go against God's word, 
Then we choose our feelings because that's how we'll be fulfilled. That's how we'll be happy. But again, throughout uh, the Bible, um, God's word, whether it's in creation or in salvation or in matters of sanctification, God's word is good. God's word creates good things. God's word directs and orders the good path. God's word brings ultimate happiness and joy and blessing into one's um, life. Did you notice in verse uh, 5 that it says about they might live? But when it says live, it's not just talking about salvation. They've already received that as God rescued them from Egypt. It's talking about fullness of life, blessing, Knowing what life is to be like. As Jesus speaks about in John's gospel, that I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And that's what God's word does, his authoritative word. So living um, under um, God's word, living under the authority of God's word, causes us to stand apart um, from um, the world. Verses 6 to 23, God forbids every sort of incest, adultery, child sacrifice, homosexuality, bestiality. And then God refers to the fact that the people of Canaan practiced those sins. And his people were not to be like them. The Canaanites who practiced these things defile themselves and the land through them. And God brought a punishment on them, verses 24 and 25. See, God wanted his people to enjoy a good life in a good society, knowing the blessings of walking with him. And it's very clear in Leviticus 18 that sin leads to suffering. Perversion leads to pollution. And the Lord was calling his people to be different, to be holy, to be set apart from those around them. Now, just in this section, let me just say, now we've highlighted some of the um, actual things that are forbidden. Um, there's a common argument against the continuation of these laws on sexual practice, and it goes like this. So this is the argument that you find in the, the, the church as it's compromised. These laws were for Israel then, and just like we're happy now to wear mixed fabrics and eat pork that are both forbidden in Leviticus, surely homosexuality and incest should be allowed too. Okay? So that's the argument. You will have heard it. It's so, it's so common. This is what was going on in the Church of England as they debated these things. One of the few things to say in response to the argument. Firstly, marriage and sex are derived from how God created us in his image, not just about how they should live in the land. So let me put it like this. Creation creates a line determining what is legitimate sexual activity. And that line is created a long time before the laws given to Israel. The second thing is, did you notice that the Canaanites, God says, are going to be punished and were punished for these practices, even though they're not Israelites with these specific commands? Now that's interesting, isn't it? For those people who want to say, oh no, they were for them, the Israelites, then and there in that place. Well, why did God punish the Canaanites? Or why did God punish Sodom and Gomorrah for these practices? If they only apply to the Israelites in a certain land at a certain time. Well, no, the line extends beyond the people of Israel when these sexual ethics commands are given. Thirdly, these laws are repeated in the New Testament Jesus speaks about them, the apostles speak of them. You can read about it in Romans, Corinthians, 1 Timothy. So the line isn't drawn at the end of the Old Testament, where clearly the food laws are. You can read about that, can't you? Jesus speaks directly about you. all food is declared clean. It's picked up by the apostles. But the line is not drawn at the Old Testament when it comes to these commands, these sexual ethics commands. And here's the fourth one. I guess most of you had an issue with that statement anyway because I included allowing incest along with homosexuality. 
And I did that because I know you yourself will still want to draw a line. When you look at those commands, you still want to draw a line somewhere because it speaks to your conscience. Let me do the statement again. These laws were for Israel then, and just like we're happy to wear mixed fabrics and eat pork, which was also forbidden in Leviticus, surely homosexuality, and of course the Church of England put the stop there, surely homosexuality should now be allowed. But do they want incest and bestiality? No, they want to draw a line. Because even though our conscience is corrupted by sin, we still recognize that these laws are given for the good of society. So these commands are not obsolete because they're derived from the created order of things, the binding on nations outside of Israel, they're repeated in the New Testament, and they speak to the conscience. So committing such acts is rebellion against God's creation design. In the beginning, God established marriage between one man and one woman, and any deviation from that pattern violates the law of God. So we're to stand apart. Well, let's just think about that a little bit more before we move to the final section. We are to stand apart from the world, and this begins by God's offer of salvation, eternal salvation in Jesus. You see, it's God who sets people free from sin, self, and Satan. He transfers us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. And once we're in that kingdom, those good rules and those good laws, we understand that they bring good, a good life, a pleasant life, a blessed life. Paul stated this truth beautifully in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Isn't this interesting? Some of the Corinthian Christians were characterized by those lifestyles before they came to Christ. But when those idolaters, adulterers, thieves, alcoholics, slanderers, homosexuals put their faith in Jesus, God took them just as they were, forgave them, reconciled them to himself, washed them, made them holy, and empowered them to walk away from their former way of life to live a new life in Christ Jesus. And the passage that I've just quoted states how we're washed and sanctified by the Spirit of God. God causes us to be set apart by bringing sanctification through his Holy Spirit. We need the Spirit of God to change us. Why? Because let me tell you this. Sexual deviance didn't come about because of Sigmund Freud, but because of the sinful flesh. It existed a long time. Our battle, our principal battle against sexual deviance is not against some ideologies out there or some psychologist. It's against the sinful flesh that gives birth to these practices. Every one of us inherits twisted ideas about our sexuality as part of our fallenness. Every one of us is affected by distorted ideas and ideologies of our culture. And we need help. We need God's strength to resist. And God gave us that help through the Holy Spirit. He uses his word and he uses his people by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit to sanctify us so that we do stand out and we're set apart. You see, there is only the Holy Spirit who wages war against the sinful flesh. Without the Holy Spirit, none of us would do that. None of us would seek to put the flesh 
um, to death. Only the Holy Spirit will enable us to live a life separated from the world, standing out. And living under the authority of God's word causes us to stand apart from the world and causes us to step forth in humility. Uh, did you notice that God told the Israelites not to commit the sins that the Canaanites were committing? And he did this knowing that they were capable of the very same sins and subject to the very same judgment if they did. Uh, let me just read verse 28 again. And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you. Then about 700 years after God spoke these words, the land did, did indeed vomit Israel out when the Assyrian army took the northern kingdom into exile. And then 150 years after that, and the southern kingdom of Judah went into exile at the hand of the Babylonians. He said, God knew his people were just as vulnerable to temptation as the Canaanites. And our Lord knows that we too are just as vulnerable to temptation and sin as those around us. So what do we do? How do we live in a sex-saturated society? Well, we step forth in humility that leads to confession of our own weakness. How do we relate to sinners around us? By having an awareness of our own bias towards sin. Here's what it says in Galatians 6, verse 1. If someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit, it has to be by the Spirit, only the Spirit can overcome the flesh. You who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. We, store, we restore others and call others to repentance with an awareness of our own vulnerability to temptation and sin. And that will drive out judgmentalism and self-righteousness as we approach those caught in sin and approach them in love. Because the sin that we condemn in someone else today may be the sin that we ourselves need to confess tomorrow. And so we go forth in humility with an awareness of our own sin and a confession of our own weakness. And we step forth in humility that leads to a commitment to the Word of God. There's no point letting go of the Word of God. Confused people need clarity. And those people who are deceived need the direct, direct truth of God that actually says, not distorted lives that make them feel better for a period of time. And as followers of Jesus in the West, where we live in this sex-saturated, sexually perverse culture, what do we need to do? We share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because as I said earlier, separation from sin begins with salvation and continues with sanctification and salvation begins when people hear the gospel and hearing of the gospel takes place when someone shares the gospel Romans 10 and if we want people to be separated from sin we must proclaim the gospel because the means of separation from sin is salvation in Jesus Christ and the sanctifying work of the Spirit. We step forth in humility that leads to concern for agendas that promote God's law. We should be grateful for and pray for and support those persons or organizations that uphold God's ways and that fight for God's truth in society. Whether it be organizations like Christian Concern or the Christian Institute or a uh, WhatsApp that was flying around um, last week to sign a petition to get an MP reinstated who'd been removed because of his um, Christian um, views. We have to stand with these people. That we live in a democracy and we have a responsibility to work, to vote for and enact laws based on the moral principles of God's word. 
And so we step forward um, to take our stand against the moral decline. And we stand in support of those who publicly do that. And we step forth in humility that leads to compassion for those who have been hurt by sexual sin. As our society becomes more perverted from God's ways, then there are going to be more casualties along the way. I don't think we've even seen how widespread it's going to be yet. And the church, and we at Christ Church Newland, should become a haven for those who are hurting, a stronghold of clarity for the confused, a place of warm welcome for those who have been wearied and wrecked by the wicked lies of the world. And the media sells sexual sin as if it brings only pleasure and never pain. But that's not the case. But we have a saviour who befriended sinners. We have a physician who can heal the deepest of pain. Our Lord Jesus Christ met people in their sin and in the pain that it caused. He brought them salvation and into freedom from sin to live in the liberty of his truth, goodness and love. And we as a church should provide that same love and truth and goodness in an uncompromising way as Jesus did. So the challenge of Leviticus 18 to you and me, sit securely under God's word, fully as the ultimate and final authority on all matters. Stand apart from the world completely as a holy people sanctified by the Spirit. Step forth in humility compassionately to a sinful and rebellious world. And let us, us who believe and have received that salvation and the indwelling Spirit, let us go out to a confused and hurting world with the clarity of truth, and with the healing of the gospel. For only the gospel will save and sanctify those lost in sexual sin. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you as we've just been thinking in humility for Lord how could we ever be judgmental or self-righteous when through your spirit we understand the corrupt nature of our own hearts And even those of us who have been saved and have your indwelling spirit, how so often we sow to the sinful nature, to the flesh rather than sowing to the spirit. Forgive us, Lord. Lord, if there are any gathered this morning who are caught in sexual sin, uh, homosexual practice, adultery, sex outside of marriage, defining themselves and defiling others. Lord, have mercy upon them. Draw them to you in true repentance and faith that they might know your salvation and the sanctifying work of your spirit. Lord, give us the strength to be uncompromising on the truth and uncompromising in our love for those who are lost and perishing in this perverted and corrupt generation. Send us forth to proclaim the gospel, to love, to welcome, to call to repentance and faith. 
For Lord, no one else will stand for your truth other than your church. And even your church is so compromised in the West that it has let go of what is true and good in favor of what is false and wicked. So we'll need your strength and we'll need your power, Lord, to be uncompromising. And we'll need your humility to confess our own weaknesses and to move forward in love. Lord, have mercy upon your church and strengthen us now with your truth. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.